Exploration, true stories of real people who lead unusual lives. Produced by the KOMO-TV Special Projects Unit in cooperation with the schools of Seattle and King County. We take you along as we examine the world and its people and bring you a story which is but a segment of the story of all men everywhere who are joined together with the common bond that is mankind itself. Tonight we turn our cameras on one of the most famous airplanes of the world, the P-51 Mustang, the plane that wrote a flaming final chapter to the saga of World War II. We'll show you dogfights over Europe and tell you the story of two Mustangs now retired being used in air shows by two Seattle men. Don McCune is your host. He'll have the story in just a moment. There were many famous aircraft of World War II. When the United States entered the war, both Germany and Japan had faster and better planes. The Messerschmitts and the Zeros could outfight and outmaneuver us. And as the war in Europe went into its final stages, however, the Allies had P-38s, P-47s, and the then new long-range P-51 Mustang. The Mustang was the little brother, protecting our bomber fleets over Germany. Luftwaffe threw its Messerschmitts into the air battle as Allied bombers, escorted by P-51s, close in on the German heartland. Since the fighter planes had shorter range than bombers, they escorted in relays, joining the fleet at checkpoints. The P-51, with the longest range of all Allied fighters, came in last and challenged the German Air Force. rolled out of the North American Aviation Plant and flew in October of 1940. This P-51 was built during the latter part of the war and was purchased by Charles Lyford of Seattle as war surplus. Lyford, who hungers for action, likes to race hydroplanes when he's not flying. And who could ask for a better sport plane than this 437 mile an hour fighter? It's a beautiful aircraft. The second P-51 at Payne Field is owned by Ben Hall of Seattle. He and Lyford fly these hot rods of the sky in air shows all over the country. Part of the enjoyment of this hobby is working on the planes. And these high-strung beauties require much affectionate tinkering. The engine is a Rolls-Royce Packard Merlin 12 cylinders with a two-stage supercharger. Top horsepower, 1695. It's the same engine used in many unlimited hydroplanes. The third man in this team is an ex-Czechoslovakian fighter pilot, Rad Kostelnik, now working in Seattle, who donates his time working on the planes and in turn gets to fly them. Chuck Lyford is ready to make his pre-flight check of the P-51 before we take off with both planes for a trip to Bellingham and a demonstration over the airfield there. This, of course, is routine with a good pilot, checking everything on the airplane before takeoff. It's called a walk-around. This rack either carries a bomb or a spare fuel tank. 
Lyford fields the leading edge of the wing for any rough spots. The controlled surfaces, like these ailerons, must move freely. The flaps, the P-51's air brakes, are checked. The elevators and the tail assembly are given a once-over and checked for freedom of movement. The rudder is next. And up front, where the air rushes in to cool the liquid-filled engine's radiator, Lightford makes a check for foreign objects. Meanwhile, Ben Hall and Rad Kostelnik are finishing their tune-up of the second P-51. Not a moment too soon, for both planes are due in an air in about an hour. Maintenance, of course, was a key factor in keeping Allied planes in the air during World War II. And these combat films over Germany show the beating these aircraft took. Ready now to take off from Payne Field with Chuck Lyford and Ben Hall. Rad Kostelnik will go along as a passenger in Chuck's plane and we'll go along in the other. Our destination is Bellingham, where we'll show the bystanders how a P-51 performs. And on the way, we'll do some aerobatics so you can get the feel of the plane.
We're at about 5,000 feet now, getting ready to do a slow roll. Our airspeed is around 400 miles an hour, and here we go. Another form of amusement in the air, especially when puffy clouds dot the blue, is the sport of cloud hopping, flying to the edges of cumulus clouds. These two P-51s make a beautiful sight as they pass in flight with Mott Baker in the background. Originally, the P-51 came off the production line without the bubble hood you see on these two. Vision was poor and pilots had such a hard time watching for the enemy that the bubble canopy was soon added. Later, rear view radar gave the pilots an even better chance of spotting trouble from behind. A familiar maneuver to anyone who has ever seen a war picture. The planes peel off, leaving their formation. One of the pilots, Ben Hall, flew the P-51 and other fighters, including jets, during wartime. Chuck Lyford was too young for the wars, but both simulate combat maneuvers when they fly the P-51. This is a simulated dogfight with Mount Baker in the background. Seven thousand nine hundred and fifty-six of these P-51Ds were built during the war. They were used first in Europe and then later in the Pacific theater of operations. P-51Ds made the first land-based fighter strikes against Tokyo on April 7th, 1945. Above 20,000 feet, the P-51D was superior to any Luftwaffe plane the Germans had. The G-suit, which inflated automatically around the calves, thighs, and lower body of the pilots during violent maneuvers, became standard equipment in flying a 51, but the airplane was tougher than the men who flew it. But once they got the G-suits, many pilots nearly tore the wings off their P-51s in dogfights, and many came back with rivets popped and several more degrees of dihedral. The only airplane that could have beaten the P-51 during World War II was the radical, for that time, Messerschmitt 262. This was the first turbojet plane of the war, tested and ready for combat by the Germans in July of 1943. But Adolf Hitler wasn't convinced that the jet fighter would help the German situation and forbade any priority production of the ME-262. So, until the end of the war, the U.S.-built P-51D was king of the sky except for a few sorties against the experimental jets the Germans were able to send up. On our way to Bellingham now, we again line up our camera with the Earth's horizon and maneuver into a slow roll. Tonight's story is called Fighter Plane. It's a story of one of the most famous of all wartime aircraft, the P-51. We'll continue our story in just a moment. It's a beautiful day for flying, and the kind of cotton candy clouds an artist might conjure up to fill a blue sky on his canvas. We're engaged in a little cloud hopping as we approach the field of Bellingham. A 
crowd is waiting below us as we bank into the traffic pattern and let down on our first pass over the Bellingham Field. The most enthusiastic spectators at an event such as this, of course, are the ex-fighter pilots who are now working the civilian side of the flight business. They usually leave whatever they're doing to watch these colorful fighters make their passes. We should add that maneuvers such as you'll see over Bellingham Airport must be cleared with the airport officials well in advance. The control tower must be in complete control of air traffic at all times. Now, here we go. These pilots would like to perform aerobatics all day, but P-51s use up gasoline like it's going out of style. And it's time to head back to Payne Field. Lyford, Hall, and Kostelnik fly these planes about three times a month, unless they're hired to fly on an air show somewhere. Lyford will head back to classes at the University of Washington tomorrow. Ben Hall will go back to his paving business, and Kostelnik will go back to his job. But these are Sunday flyers out for a good time in the air. For Kostelnik, it's a trip back into the past to when he flew Messerschmitt 109s and MiGs for the Czechoslovakian Air Force. He and fellow Czechs used to shoot down Radio Free Europe balloons before Kostelnik and a friend decided they'd had enough of communism and took off on a private plane one Sunday, landing in Austria where they were interned and then working for the US in West Germany and in Washington, D.C. For all three men, Kostelnik, Leifert, and Hall, each day in the air is an adventure, a test of their skills and their judgment, and a chance to show off to some of the younger people one of the great planes of World War II. And this four-ton Hornet, the P-51, is indeed all that. It was unquestionably the finest of all American wartime fighters, and ranked in merit with the best of any other combatant. The P-51 was an inspired design evolved almost by accident. It outperformed all other US AAF types in speed, range, and maneuverability. And although produced in slightly smaller numbers than the P-47 Thunderbolts, it eventually re-equipped all but one 8th Air Force Thunderbolt group and established itself as the principal allied strategic fighter. Its reputation was made during the last two years of the war, the first combat group having arrived in the United Kingdom in November of 1943. It could have been operational much earlier in the war, but when it did get into combat, the results were devastating. Near the end of the war, its mission was to finish the destruction of the German Air Force in the air and on the ground.
No trains were safe from strafing. Barges were shot up and marshalling yards. Flak towers were straight. And radio stations in Germany. Ammunition trucks on German roads were exploded with machine gun fire from P-51s. And staff cars, like the one carrying General Rommel, were straight. During the final months of the war, our Air Force mission was to destroy everything that looked warlike. And by then, our fighters had knocked out the opposing Air Force, and the air was ours. And so you see, it's with great pride and a sense of history, and a feeling of tribute to the men who flew these planes in wartime, that our three Payne Field Flyers show off their P-51s and air shows around the country. Every time Lyford or Hall make a full throttle pass over a gaping crowd. They are paying their respects to the American flying aces of World War II, many of whom failed to return from European combat missions, but whose raw courage and flying skill won us a war. And that's our story. A camera's eye view of the fastest propeller-driven airplane ever to leave the production line. The story of the P-51 Mustang. One of the planes which helped write a finish to World War II. A famous fighter plane that still lives on more than 20 years later as a hobby for two Sunday flyers from Seattle. This is Don McCune. Good night.